So this lecture will cover the contents of Laboratory 1, Discrete Event System Simulation Basics. This is a relatively short lab that will cover some of the content that we've seen in lecture and allow you to practice it. You can also use it as an exercise to help you with upcoming homework that you'll see on the lecture side of the course. All right, so just as a recap of what we've um, seen so far is why might we build a simulation model? Now in lecture we've talked about lots of different reasons why. Three particular cases of those reasons are given here. We might want to compare two hypothetical designs of real systems, but we would like to do that in a simulation model where we don't actually have to build those two alternatives in real life. We might want to improve upon an existing system and it might be infeasible for us to do in, uh, in real life, and so we need to show the improvements ahead of time. Or we just, in general, would like to create a totally new uh, hypothetical system, so maybe a system that we don't even have the po any possible ability to build in the short term, but we could say, well, what if we had such a system? Then that, that what-if system we can then experiment with, and then that helps us guide our decisions in the real world for real systems. So these are just some of the reasons why we might build a simulation model. Notice that, that what if term came up in that last one. Again, our definition of a model is anything that helps us answer these what if questions. Now in this class, we primarily focus on discrete event system or DES simulation models. And those are usually built to capture dynamical system behavior. We will certainly see other types of models like Monte Carlo simulation uh, that aren't really focused on the dynamical system behavior, but in general, the models that you build in this class, we're gonna be focusing on how things change over time. We're gonna be watching these systems as they move from one point to another in time, and we might care about the performance at any particular time as opposed to just the performance at the end. Now, these models are typically stochastic. What that means is that instead of taking an approach where we need to come up with a mathematical formula to understand every single way that something changes from one thing to another, we just sort of say, well, we are going to find a probabilistic distribution that generates outcomes that look very similar to the outcomes we see in the real world. So even though the real world ones, maybe there does exist some mathematical way for us to say, you know, how frequently someone enters a classroom or enters a restaurant and those sorts of things. If we instead just know that on average people enter five times an hour into a particular restaurant, then we just generate randomly uh, people, you know, simulated people entering the restaurant five times in an hour. And as long as we've kind of chosen the distribution of those arrivals just right, then we'll get uh, realistic looking arrivals without having to go into the details of figuring out traffic and people's work schedules and all of those sorts of things. So we don't have to simulate the people in their entire lives if we can just capture a distribution of roughly when they arrive at the system of interest. All right, so these DES simulation models generally consist of entities. That's a term that we will use over and over again. Those entities move from location to location, and you can think of them as passive. They're just kind of billiard balls that come into existence randomly and then get pushed around a system um, by these processes that they move through. So they move from location to location, and how they move might vary with their attributes. So if we're thinking about billiard balls, it might be that the red ball uh, moves through a different way than the blue ball, or the red ball takes a longer amount of time in one part of the simulation than the green ball, and so on. So, uh, and the thing that holds them all up is the availability of resources. And so uh, those resources are the things that they actually are moving from. And so if a resource isn't available, but those entities have to go through that resource, then they wait. And they wait for the other entities to get done with those resources, and once they're finished, then they can move in. So while moving, they change what we say the state of the system. And so the system is in some state, and that state might be 
Uh, you know, there's so many billiard balls waiting on this resource and so many billiard balls waiting on that resource. And at once you move uh, out of re one resource and into another, it changes how many are waiting. And so the state is like a snapshot of these dynamical things that are happening uh, throughout the system. So here's kind of more formal definitions of those are given on the slide. I won't kind of read through them um, uh, in, uh, in word for word, but I also will point out some things I haven't mentioned yet, like this term, an event. The event in discrete event system simulation is an instant of time that marks when the state of the system has changed. So in a, you could view an event as inducing a state change, or you can view an event as just the bookkeeping, the timestamp that represents when the state has changed. So if someone arrives at a bank that you're modeling, that arrival is an event. Uh, this is different than an activity. An activity is a duration of time. It's the length of time. So if someone arrives at, an, at a bank, that is an event. But the time that they spend with a teller at the bank is an activity. So uh, then there's this other thing that we haven't gotten into yet about a delay. So the time they spend waiting in line is a delay because that actually depends upon the state of the system. But once they hit the teller, then that doesn't depend on the state of the system. All tellers take a certain amount of time that we can kind of characterize uh, probabilistically. So we'll get into those details later. For now, I at least want you to be able to, to identify entities, attributes, events, activities, resources, and these states and state variables. So states are the actual current uh, status of a system. It is in this particular state, whereas the state variable is kind of, um, uh, it's like a variable. It's like X or Y. It's the thing that we use to keep track of the state. Let's see, uh, you know, give more concrete examples. So on the next slide, we have this manufacturing system. So in a manufacturing system, the entities might be parts. Parts arrive um, needing to be assembled. And so they just show up and, uh, and then suddenly they get moved through the manufacturing system. How do you differentiate one part from another? What well, has different features, different part numbers, different colors? These are all different attributes. So each part can have an attribute, and those attributes have these types, and those are instantiated with, you know, so this part is red and this part is green, and we would say that attribute is the color of the part. That's very often we keep track of the arrival time of an entity, and the arrival time becomes an attribute. It's just something you can, like a post-it note that you can stick on the, the the entity and it rides around of the entity and it can be changed uh, along the way. Then there's events. Those are instantaneous uh, moments in time that where the state of the system changes. A machine failure is an event. At any instant a machine could break down and then the state of the system would go from having four working machines to only having three working machines. A process could complete and when a process completes, a machine goes from being busy to being idle. Uh, a part can arrive. And when a part arrives, then a queue goes from having three parts waiting for service to having four parts waiting for service. Resources are those things that the entities are waiting on. The machines are always in the system, and so we view them as resources. Entities arrive, and they have to wait on a machine. So if you don't see something moving through your system, if it's always in your system while other things kind of move through it, it's probably a resource. If it's making other things wait, it's probably a resource. Activities are the duration of, say, processing a part. So the machine takes a certain amount of time processing the part. Let's say it's smoothing the part down, or it's painting the part, or it's assembling two parts together. That takes a certain amount of time, and that time does not depend on the state of the system. If I give the machine a part, it will always take this amount of time to paint the part. It might have some distribution where sometimes it's lower than that and sometimes it's higher than that, but it's not like the number of things waiting on that machine are going to affect how fast that machine can paint the part. It always paints at the same rate although there might be some slop in that. And then the states. So each machine is either in a busy or an idle state. So we would view those as two states, busy and idle, but we might create a variable called like M1, which would be a variable that stores the state of machine one. 
So m1 would be a state variable, and then the thing that's stored in m1 would be either busy or idle, which would be a state, which we might encode as a 0 or a 1. All right, I'll go that through that a little more quickly with the school. So in the school, students show up to the school. They wait on teachers to be available. They wait on rooms to be available. Uh, so uh, the students are the entities. Each student is differentiated by their GPA, their major, their name, their student ID number. Uh, the events that cause the school to change, the school state to change, are things like a student arrives. A student arrives and you went from having five students in the school to having six students in the school. A class begins. When a class begins, you go from having uh, no classes in session to having suddenly all of them in session. A class ends. When the class ends, then maybe the instructor that was in that class is now free to go to another class. So all these things represent uh, state changes in the system. Resources, I've mentioned classrooms and instructors. These are things that make the entities wait. They make students wait. Students can't enter a classroom until that classroom is free. Uh, students maybe can't leave the classroom until the instructor is finished. So instructors and classrooms make students wait, so we call them the resources. Activities, that is the length of time that the classroom is used up or the instructor is used up. So the activities are the duration, how much time you, that the entities are waiting. And then the states, so each classroom, that might be our state variable classroom, has maybe two states, full or empty, which again we might encode as one or zero. Now, you can imagine that there's probably different ways that you can take the same system and flip it around so that things that were once resources become entities and vice versa. And that's fine. You have to ask yourself, what's the best model for a system? And that's not always an easy question. But then, but your model just has to be consistent. So if students are the entities, then it makes sense for instructors and classrooms to be the resources. But maybe we're modeling not a school, but some small part of a school, like a Starbucks on campus. Well, in that case, students and instructors are probably both entities because they're both waiting on service from the coffee shop. So depending on what you're modeling and how you're modeling it, these things might move around. But within one model, you should be able to point out these are my entities and these are my resources, and it should make sense that way. And once you have that figured out, it's easy to encode them in languages like Arena that make everything move and actually do the simulation for you. All right, so what do we do today during lab? So this is a 30-point lab. Uh, that doesn't make that much of a difference uh, because uh, everything's pooled into one big lab group and all the labs I think are roughly the same amount of points. This is an individual assignment, so I want each one of you to work on this assignment or at least to submit an assignment separately. Of course, you can talk to your neighbors, you can talk to your classmates as you're coming up with ideas, but I don't want two people to submit the same thing. If you're coming up with ideas together, you should be able to come up with twice the ideas, twice the number of examples. If we see submissions that look like they're copies of each other, then that's academic misconduct. And so um, just make sure you're submitting unique work. The goals for your, uh, for your time in the lab today is actually just to finish the assignment. You can com complete the entire three-part lab um, in one sitting, I think, uh, easily. But if you don't, then, uh, then you can look at the due dates online. So traditionally, these labs are due Sunday night. So question one, the first part of the lab, is I just want you to name several, and by several I mean at least two of each type, Entities, attributes, activities, events, resources, and state variables for these four systems here. So a hospital emergency room, just go and name two entities, two attributes, two activities, two events, two resources, and two state variables that you might use if you were building a model of a hospital emergency room. Do that again for a taxi cab company, again for a fire department, again for a fast food restaurant. It would make it easier to grade if your pairs of entities, attributes, etc. for each case, like hospital emergency room, kind of were work, working together as if you built them in one model. So you could imagine that you could probably conceptualize a hospital emergency room two different ways. And in one way, the patients are resources, and in another way, the patients are entities. 
And, um, and so that makes it sort of difficult for us if you list patients in both places, and you probably will get marked off for that. So try to imagine if you dreamed up one model of a hospital emergency room, in that model, what is a way, what would the entities be, what would the resources be, and so on, so that when we read your solution for the hospital emergency room, we can kind of think of it as a specification for a single model. Again, if you work with someone else on this, make sure you're submitting unique submissions with unique ideas. You should be able to come up with double the ideas if, uh, if you're working with someone uh, so that you both don't submit the same entities and so on. All right, second part, move away from the emergency room into a waste collection system. So in this waste collection system, Imagine you've got different waste disposal sites, like these landfill areas that are far from a city, and so you use trucks to move things from wherever the trash is uh, created to where they need to go, and there is a pipeline that you have to move through in order to get the trash from the collection trucks to the trucks that take it to their final destination. So we've sort of summarized a pipeline here where the trucks arrive to ports, they get unloaded on cranes, they get put into hoppers, they get then moved down conveyors into compactors and then loaded up onto trailers, and then those trailers um, get, uh, get plugged into um, to semis so that they, um, the semi-permanent trucks can then um, take in and unload them wherever they need to be unloaded. So all this is summarized in this image here, and what we want you to do is to do something similar to what you just did. So using this description of the system, if you wanted to model this and build eventually a discrete event system simulation model, what would the entities, attributes, activities, events, state variables, and resources be for this system? Again, give two examples for each category. And again, if you're working with someone else, make sure you have different answers on your submission. So make sure to mix it up a bit so that it's clear that you're both showing off your individual efforts. All right, last part of this is we're going to switch it a little bit and we want you to explore the different simulation uh, frameworks that are out there. And so we want you to go to your favorite search engine, uh, you know, Google, Bing, whatever it might be, and identify four examples of simulation uh, software packages that are currently being used. You'll find there is a huge number of simulation software packages, and you don't have to stick to just degree, discrete event system simulation packages, although there are a lot of those. You can go to agent-based modeling or system dynamics modeling or other types of multi-model or whatever. But for each package you identify, give us the name of the package, the software licensing model, for example, is it totally free? Is it limited use without commercial uh, license? Is it totally unavailable without purchase? Give a URL of where you can find the software package. So basically that thing that's at the top of the web browser, tell us, uh, you know, what's the address where you can download that and tell us the vendor. So who, who makes uh, this uh, software package or at least develops it? And then finally summarize the kind of simulation model or models that are supported by the software package. So again, DES, SDM, ABM, some of these packages will support multiple. And then that's the last thing that you'll need to report in this document. You can then upload the document to Canvas um, in the assignment that is associated with this lab and we'll get graded by your TA.